Harry gets a grilling, Catherine gets her boots on and Prince Andrew gets stopped in his tracks by a dog walker. We'll be tackling all the royal stories, big and small. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and here to discuss all the week's stories are the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the paper's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome both. Now, a reminder that if you don't already, make sure you subscribe to our channel and never miss another episode. We'll, of course, come to Harry's two days in court in a few moments, but we're going to kick things off with the cutest news of the week. Another royal baby, Rebecca. Tell us who it is and why the world had to wait a little bit for the news. Princess Eugenie has had her second baby, a little boy, I think seven pounds, one ounce, called Ernest George Ronnie, which I think is a lovely name because she's got August, who she calls Augie, so she's got Ernie and Augie. Oh, but I really <laughs> need more detail on the erroneous not very royal Ronnie. Where does that come from? That comes from, from Ronald Ferguson, who was her maternal grandfather, i.e. Fergie's father. And also there's a nod there to George V, who was George, uh, obviously, but also had Ernest as a middle name. And George was the name of uh, Jack Brooksbank, her husband's late father. And Ernest, apparently, they just, just liked it. Gorgeous. Now, Richard, how long do you expect to wait to have young Ernest gracing the pages of your diary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, give, give, give him a chance. Let's let him walk. Well, and I mean, you know, come on. Talk yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, essentially, it all depends on how much of a role Princess Eugenie has in in the future. Um, you know, you remember that Queen Elizabeth sort of shared the burden of of her work with her cousins. You know, she had the Duke of Gloucester, Duke of Kent, Princess Alexandra, all carrying out engagements and doing things with her. I mean. Personally, in the future, I'd quite like to see Prince William being helped by his cousins, such as Princess Eugenie and Princess Beatrice, who we saw um, looking so beautiful at the wedding in Jordan um, last week. You know, I think they really would help Prince William when the time comes and be a really useful addition to the family. I thought it was a really lovely surprise actually seeing Princess yeah. Beatrice in Jordan in the York tiara, which we haven't seen yes. for decades, and she really kind of conducted herself with incredible plomb and elegance and like there was a really good feedback on social media and people were saying oh, I'd like to see a little bit more of that. Yeah I mean maybe not now but perhaps in the future um, you know when their cousin's king that they might feel that it's the right time to sort of dedicate their life to royal duties perhaps. And, well I'm also looking forward to a 90 plus Richard Eden still banging away at that diary <laughs> collar. That's, that's an image for Come us on, all isn't it? Give me a break. Me a break. <laughs> no never. Now well if you love a royal baby and who doesn't make sure you check out our montage. Come Coming up a bit later in the show, but Rebecca, to the Princess of Wales now, she's been busy. What's she been up to? She has. So earlier this week, she was at a, a thing called the Windsor Hub, which is basically for families in the Windsor area, providing with them support and help. And there was some kind of great conversation there. But yesterday, I was with her at Maidenhead Rugby Club for a really fantastic event that was so kind of multifaceted. So we had her in a sports gear. Um, notice actually she had the same same trainers uh, that I've got. Um, okay. That uh, I saw people on social media saying, should we call them ugly trainers? So did I was quite did, slightly offended by that. Excuse me, did the Princess <laughs> of Wales steal your look? She, yeah, for yeah. once, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, and she was playing a game of walking rugby with two England rugby stars. But there was a, a serious uh, point to the visit because they also had a kind of group discussion. It's all about this big project of hers to highlight the importance of the years from zero from birth to five and it was a discussion on fatherhood and what their experiences at fathers have been like and what support better support they could get and it was a I think what was really interesting is listening to this conversation I've always said about the Princess of Wales is I don't think she's always been the strongest communicator you know it's been a it's been a learning curve for her she's not necessarily been comfortable with that but she sat there the only woman amongst this you know table full of you know very successful sportsmen and she really held the floor asked questions the right questions directing them to different people listening to their answers I think it's a subject she obviously feels quite comfortable talking about but you it was a bit of a light bulb moment for me I thought you could really see her coming into her own and um, I, I was really quite impressed with her yesterday R remind me of um, Catherine's age 40 something right? 41 yeah, yeah so I think I just think that that confidence will just grow and grow with she, age and, yeah. and you know for some of it, me included, you know, television is, is not a natural forum. It's quite intimidating. And I don't think we should berate her for that. Obviously, she has a lot more 
you know, professional help and, and support. But, um, you know, she herself has said she's really had to pull herself out of her comfort zone to do it. And I, I thought she was really good yesterday. I think you more than hold your own English. Oh, I don't I think know. you're all right. But <laughs> now, Richard, we haven't seen much of the lesser spotted Prince Andrew <laughs> recently, but he looked pretty jolly when he was encountered by a dog walker the other day. I think because he doesn't carry out any kind of official duties anymore, there's quite a lot of interest in, you know, seeing what, what he is up to. And these photographs, I must admit, they made me laugh out loud. It was <clears throat> him in a Range Rover with a friend or a colleague um, on the long walk and they were behind um, a lady walking her dogs but they're obviously going so slow and maybe the car's electric so you know it doesn't make much noise or at maybe all. the dog walk is like yeah, or, uh, yeah. <laughs> and she seemed to be blissfully unaware yeah. of the car right behind her so she was just carrying sauntering along and I think they were getting a bit frustrated but it's not a very good image to start you know beeping <laughs> beeping your horn yeah he's got enough PR problems <laughs> he, yeah. he, did, he did wind down his window at one point sort of put his head out so I think perhaps he was tempted to shout you know get a move on but 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 he I think he resisted it and she eventually realized and walked over but they made for some and you saw that him in the car having a good laugh about it afterwards um, so anyway despite whatever his life is these days at least he can have a laugh sometimes well I think the main <laughs> takeaway there is that dogs outrank royals and yeah. that's, you know that's the one thing in my view but Rebecca we also heard the news at the weekend that the king was going to give up his Welsh home Yes, now come on, I'm going to try and pronounce this, and I apologise to any kind of native Welsh speakers. I think it's so pronounced something like Clinwernwod. Um, and How are you spelling that? <laughs> <laughs> I won't make you do that. You are a horror, you really are. Um, uh, so basically, it's a property he had since he was Prince of Wales. Um, it was uh, purchased by the Duchy of Cornwall as part of a number of rentals, holiday rentals they have in the area, uh, which they which they did up and uh, you know are making money for the Duchy of Cornwall. But there's one of those properties in this little kind of group uh, of, of properties in Wales that he used maybe a couple of times a year. I mean, I do think this story has been slightly overspun in as much as when the Queen died and his son became Prince of Wales and took over the duchy, it eventually was his property now. He, his father still said, well, let's see how it goes. I might still want to use it. So effectively, William was his dad's landlord and obviously he's just realized look I'm just not going to be able to go there that much and if I do I'm going there as a king in a slightly different capacity so he's not paying any rental for it now but I think some people have been minded to kind of suggest this is oh you see they've been quite parsimonious they're downsizing and not not really is the <laughs> answer it's still there you know and it will be rented out as holiday property so I have a question do you think it's possible that the royal family forgets how many houses they've got. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot, and we've spoken about it a lot on this programme, haven't we, Richard? It's yeah. a perennial problem. For I mean, them. it'll be interesting to see where Prince William stays when he, he's making his visits to Wales. Mm. Um, so I'm sure they'll be using some of these properties, won't they? Well, no, see, this is the interesting point, actually. William's lot has made very clear to me. When they went to Wales uh, fairly recently, I actually said, are they going to use this Dushing mm. property? And they said, no, they're going to go and stay in a local hotel kind of B&B &B because they want to publicize um, uh, businesses uh, in the area and they've effectively made clear that he has no plans to use his property mm. whatsoever it doesn't mean the property we wasted because it's always a holiday rental mm. but he's going to go and stay at different places well, that's so a good he's opportunity going to do then different. for local hotel owners you know yeah, yeah absolutely you've got a place to stay fit, fit for a future king look yeah. at this Wales is lovely this time of year yeah Let's turn to some of your comments now. And we had lots of praise after our special episode about the King with Richard Kay. And if you missed it, head back and check that one out after this. Meanwhile, Louise Kant wrote in supporting the idea that the Princess Royal could have a role helping the King to manage the family. It was always said that the late Queen ruled the country while Philip ruled the family. And since Camilla married into the family fairly late, it's hard to see her in a similar role as Philip. But I absolutely can see Princess Anne in this role quite clearly. Mary Kale, meanwhile, thinks that Charles is doing just fine in that department and she says what the Queen did with Andrew was put distance between the rogues and the parts of the family who do official business. It is crystal clear who represents the family and who doesn't. No change. I think Charles is doing fine. Kathy Edens, 
no relation, commented on the story that the king was reported to be frustrated that his work was overshadowed by that of the Waleses. And she writes, Charles has to realise that he can't expect William and Catherine to take on more and more royal duties, but not receive additional press as a result. Sticking with the Waleses, Stephanie Shang has nothing but praise for the way William and Catherine approach family life. She says, it's very wise of William and Catherine to prioritise their children over royal duties. Raising emotionally healthy, stable children is in every everyone's best interests. We've seen the effects of the other way around and it's not good. Hmm. No comment. Right. Well, the Duke of Sussex has been back in London and back in court this week, giving evidence to a civil case against the publishers of the Daily Mirror newspaper, who he alleges were hacking his phone, claims that the group denies. The Daily Mail's chief reporter, Sam Greenhill, has been following the case. Another week and another High Court case involving Prince Harry. This time the Duke of Sussex has been in the witness box. It's a historic moment. It's the first time in over 100 years that a senior royal has given testimony. And the world's press has turned out to watch him. Watch him, Harry, the former soldier, fighting to prove that he is a victim of tabloid newspaper phone hacking. He spent a gruelling day and a half in the witness box being challenged to justify his claims. Mirror Group newspapers says there is no evidence that its titles ever hacked Prince Harry. The paper's KC, Andrew Green, said the evidence was zero, zilch, nada. But Harry says unscrupulous journalists listen to his voicemails on an industrial scale right the way through his life from childhood at Ludgrove School and through Eton and his army days and into adulthood. He says he was hacked on an almost daily basis. Stories were intrusive and cruel, and Harry said they ruined some of his friendships and relationships. There was one based on the rumor that James Hewitt was really his father. He said that made him fear he might be ousted from the royal family. Another story was about him referring to his mother, Princess Diana's former butler, Paul Burrell, as a two-faced, and then a rude word beginning with S and ending in T. Other stories was one such as when he had a secret dinner date with the late TV presenter, Caroline Flack. He said all these stories came from hacking. There was another article about his girlfriend, Chelsea Davy being allegedly furious with him for attending a lap dancing club. Harry said that story came from hacking, but he also told the judge that it was full of inaccuracies. He said uh, the idea that there was a Chelsea Davy lookalike naked dancer wasn't true. He said uh, it was supposedly a Lithuanian lap dancer sat in my lap, he told Mr Justice Fancourt. Now the newspaper group denies ever hacking the prince. It says many of the stories that Harry complains about were actually published in other newspapers, sometimes days or even weeks before they appeared in the mirror. One or two were on the BBC and in some cases they came from official palace statements. And Harry was shown one article, which actually came from an interview that he himself had given a few days earlier. The Mirror's KC, Andrew Green, said that if Harry thought these stories came from hacking, then he was in the land of total speculation. On his second day in the witness box, Harry was far more bullish and confident. He said that stories in the People newspaper were highly suspicious because they were quoting palace sources and this was at a time he said when he and Chelsea were being incredibly careful and the palace he said didn't know anything he accused the newspaper of destroying vast amounts of evidence to cover up its criminality at the end of his evidence Harry looked close to tears but his part in this case is now over now it's over to the judge and I think it will be several months before Mr Justice Fancourt says who has won Sam Greenhill there. Well, let's come back to my panel. Rebecca, Harry criticising the media, that's one thing we all are pretty clear on where he stands on that. But having a pop at the government will surely have rankled a few in the palace. Uh, they've rankled a few in the government, I think, as well. <laughs> um, because obviously the convention between the royal family is and the government is that they don't criticise each other. Um, uh, because they're all obviously, you know, uh, parts of the, the kind of organisation that, that govern us. Um, 
What Harry did was he went in uh, into the witness box and in his statement he said that basically he thinks not only did the, has the media in this country hit rock bottom but he thinks the government have hit rock bottom, which is, is a pretty strong uh, statement to, to make. From, from um, a royal working or not. E exactly. And, and again, this shows you the, the kind of the situation where, you know, Harry is very confused in his approach because he says, I'm no longer a working royal. But then he goes into court and says, I'm here as a member of a royal family standing up doing what I feel is right so you can't really have both and it put our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in the really unenviable position of being asked by journalists what have you got to say about this and he said very clearly and maybe slightly awkwardly um, well obviously by convention I don't really feel I should comment about the royal family or what they've said but I would like to say I think this country and this government are doing you know great things for, for, for Great Britain um, um, so the fact that Harry has said that put the Prime Minister in a position of having to respond to it, which was very awkward. Do you think there's, well, speaking of orcs, hashtag orcs, as the kids might say, Richard, it's surely going to make things tricky for Harry's father and brother. I think it will, but it means, you know, at least that they can say he's no longer part of are sort of firm like yes he's a member of the royal family and he made that clear you know at the start of his witness statement and he's made that very clear in court um, but you know he's he's no longer part they can sort of say well almost that's why we got rid of him kind of thing um, you know because of this well but it's he got rid of himself but yeah, yeah but yeah. it's it's very it's a very difficult situation it's it's unhelpful to everyone it's unhelpful to the government and unhelpful to the royal family yes what did you think Rebecca of um, for those who work in the media Harry's version of how things work won't have necessarily all made sense will it yeah I mean without being too navel gazing I, mean, I do think his evidence showed he has a basic lack of understanding about legitimate news gathering and also an unwillingness to understand because he has in his head such a such a defined vision of what he thinks the media is and he's not really willing to um, to divert from that but I also think it shows his well, he showed this week his kind of contempt for new stories you know that what he feels is should be in the public interest and is newsworthy. He clearly disagrees from uh, not just uh, newspapers, but from broadcasters, what they feel is interesting to their readers and viewers. And I think I think what we saw this week was a conflation between his contempt for you know the industry generally and what what people are avid to consume and what he thinks is is right for them to consume. And you know, is that in itself a legislative matter? That's just a point of view, isn't it? That's. Mm. Well, I, I, I would I, I would say it is a point of view, and and I think it's come across in court. But whether that's actually relevant yeah. to the case that he's bringing, I'm I'm not so sure. Richard, do you think it's fair to say? I mean, obviously, Harry being a royal in the dock is making history, but it's also for him it would be unlike any grilling that he's ever had before. How do you think he's faring with that? I mean this whole case to me is just extraordinary. I mean I appreciate it's a civil case rather than a criminal one so there's a very different bar but I mean you know, there he is. He's sort of admitting he doesn't have any evidence of, of the, the case. He's saying, you know, th these various stories have appeared. I think I've got my suspicions, but he's admitted, you know, there's no evidence that illegal methods were used. Um, I mean, he, for him, it's been uncomfortable. You know, he had um, what was it, five hours of cross examination from. Um, Andrew Green, King's Counsel, and it was very uncomfortable. I mean, over the years he's given the odd interview, um, but they've always been very soft and kind, sort of letting him make the points he wants to make. Mm. But this has been putting him on the spot because, you know, that barrister is there to to ask difficult questions, to try and find out the truth. He's not there just to let him speak his truth, like we've seen in the you know dreadful Oprah Winfrey interview. He's trying to get to the actual truth, and that's something which you know is, is a whole different matter for Harry. So, Richard, an intriguing line from your Palace Confidential newsletter this week that royal sources have told you that, quote unquote, there has never been more relief that Harry and Meghan quit royal duties. Well, just imagine, I mean, you know, Harry has made clear that he now sees it as his sort of life's mission is to, you know, radically change the media in Britain and, and clearly the government as well, judging by his latest comments. 
So there's just relief that he's now not trying to do that from within the royal family. You know, I mean, it, one of his great complaints, as outlined in his memoirs, it was just the fact that the rest of the royal family and the courtiers and everyone wouldn't support him in, in this mission. He wanted to launch various court cases, um, and they were reluctant to do so. And well, this shows why. I mean, you know, washing dirty linen in public, you know, all this very awkward questions, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's not good. Um, for the royal family or for anyone. So I think they're just very much relieved that he's doing it as an independent litigant rather than on behalf of anyone else. Yeah, and Rebecca, do you think it's fair to say that obviously the government awkwardness aside, that Harry hasn't really strayed into too many areas that the palace would be massively concerned about? I mean, certainly it's not been to the extent of anything that we've seen in any of his interviews or, you know, in, in spare. Exactly. Um, that said, I think the whole decision to go ahead with this and to appear in court it is uncomfortable for the royal family. Um, it's not the, the path they would choose. And he has, of course, within the court case, uh, made certain statements, like he's reiterated the fact that he believes that his, uh, because this has never been confirmed, I should stress, that his brother, Prince William, uh, took a private settlement from uh, the newspaper group Concern now. Obviously, that is William's entitled to do it, and he's entitled to keep that private if he so wishes, because there may be very specific reasons he wants to keep it private. Uh, we don't know, but of course, Harry chose before the case started to make it public and reiterated that in the witness box. So mm. he is actually making statements that uh, his family clearly have not given him permission to do. So it's not. It's it's. It's not been as bad as it could have been for them, I don't think, but it's clearly not been entirely comfortable. Well, moving on just for a second, Rebecca, you're off to a royal engagement straight after this. Your life is so glamorous. Well, what literally over there. Literally <laughs> over there. Yeah. What's happening? Um, I don't know if you can ever see out the back of the windows, uh, but we're very close to Lambeth Palace, which is uh, not only home to the Archbishop of Canterbury, but they've got this amazing place there called the Garden Museum, and the Queen is going to be there. Um, I can say this now because, of course, by the time the programme comes out, the, the engagement will be over. But she's there as part of their annual flower festival. Um, but there's also going to be there the um, Alan Titchmarsh, who's obviously a very popular presenter in the UK. There's going to be um, Shane Connolly, who actually designed those incredible floral arrangements at the coronation. Oh, wow. mm. And there's an amazing charity there called Floral Angel, so she's a patron of, that um, came up with this wonderful idea of all these big events in London, not just royal events, society events. You've probably yeah. seen amazing <laughs> yeah. decorations at some of these events, that they go around after the events have finished and take the um, arrangements and then re kind of re purpose them and take them to hospices Aww. and you know children's That's centers lovely. and community centers around London and they're a great charity very small all staffed by volunteers so they're going to be there so a big shout out to Floral Angels I suspect well. um, the gardener Alan Titchmarsh might want to tell you his favorite story which is when he went to collect his honor from the Queen she said you've given a lot of ladies a lot of pleasure <laughs> Did he say he didn't know quite which way to take that? <laughs> Can you elaborate, Mr. Titchmarsh? I think, I think it's worth explaining. He's something of a housewife's favourite in the he UK. He is. So. And what a glorious day it is in London today for such an occasion. Do you think that you could sneak Richard and me in? I'll come along. Yeah. Why not? Let's I'll pretend to be a garden gnome. Let's try. I'm sure it's not the first thing that Richard's <laughs> been thrown out of if he is. <laughs> or me. Or me. Well, as promised, we do have some more royal babies. My idea for a montage, all those unflattering pictures of, from court of Harry and the court sketches, that got thrown out in the meeting. So get, instead, we're going with cuteness. Here's a look back at some of our favourite baby pictures.
let's hope we don't have to wait too long for another cute little baby to arrive. And a reminder that if you enjoy our content, do remember to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of our royal shows like this one. We hope you've enjoyed it. We've had fun. Thanks to Rebecca and Richard and to you, of course, for watching. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.